We are live on the Alex Jones Show on the verge of what looks like another disastrous military intervention into the Middle East, not just on behalf of America, but other Western nations too. Steve Herman, a chief uh, White House bureau chief with VOA, tweets further indications just now from French President Emmanuel Macron and the Saudi Crown Prince that a multinational military action is being planned to respond to the latest reported chemical weapons attack against civilians in Syria. Also, Macron said if strikes are launched in Syria, they will target the chemical weapons capabilities of the Assad re regime. Wait a sec, I thought, I thought they gave up the chemical weapons. I thought that's why we didn't do this back in 2013. We also have uh, destroyers steaming their way towards Syria right now. The US Navy destroyer USS Donald Cook is already in the region. As of yesterday, it's equipped with 60 Tomahawk cruise missiles. We also have this headline, US missile destroyer reportedly sailing towards Syria as Trump weighs options. Then we have a uh, seven warship strike group with cruise missiles on its way to the Mediterranean. That is the Harry S. Truman carrier strike group. But they're saying that's so not gonna reach Syria until April 22nd, which is in 12 days time. So it's, it's pretty bizarre how if this is supposed to be a quick, rapid response strike, they're allowing Syria to prepare for it, make maneuvers, get certain things out of the way. So could they be waiting for a massive strike, which includes Saudi Arabia, France, the UK, all these different countries? If so, it's going to be very different from what happened last year, when, of course, they basically just did one symbolic strike on an air base, not very many people died, not very much damage was done. It was a symbolic act. It was pretty pointless. This looks like it could be something way bigger and that they may take a little more time to arrange it, at least in terms of an international alliance. Now, to talk about all this, we're joined by Syrian girl Maram Susli, who, is, of course, is a regular contributor for Infowars.com. She is a geopolitical analyst for New Eastern Outlook. And she put out a video a couple of days ago called What Really Happened Chemical Attack That Led to Missile Strikes on Syria. And she's here to talk about it now. Maram, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Now, let's get into the background of this, because, you know, unlike the Trump administration, it seems, unlike Pre President Macron, unlike Saudi Arabia, we're not just going to uh, have a flippant, reckless reaction not knowing any of the evidence. Let's actually look at what could have possibly happened in this town both before and after when this chemical attack happened. What was the situation in the town of Douma before this alleged attack happened? Was there any, any kind of battlefield or strategic motive for the Syrian army to launch this attack? What was the situation on the ground before it happened? No, um, there wasn't. And it's exactly as you said, you know, Douma is a suburb that's part of a bigger suburb called Ghouta. Um, now, the insurgents that controlled Ghouta, which were Al-Qaeda linked, by the way, and the US, even in the United Nations, agreed that Al-Qaeda was controlling this city, uh, the majority of them actually surrendered and had already given up their weapons or taken a bus ride to another town called Idlib. So the only group that hadn't surrendered was this group called the Islamic Army, or Jaysh al-Islam. And the reason they didn't surrender and they controlled Douma is because they had leverage in the form of hostages, civilian hostages that they had kidnapped from nearby pro-Assad towns. Um, and these are the wives and children of basically Syrian soldiers. And, and these civilians, they took them and they put them in cages in about 2015, and they paraded them around Douma and said that, you know... These are the moderates. These are I the moderates see. that put people in cages and parade them around. In fact, I've seen, I've seen the video clips of that, parading them around in cages. They had the, another video which you play, which there was one of the victims, they made them walk through like underground tunnels and they look very distressed, but we're playing some of that footage now of them in the cages. So this group, this army of Islam, that they were the remaining factions who refused to surrender because as far as I understand it, the other rebels had agreed, right, with the Syrians that they would leave within 48 hours for these other rebel-controlled areas and they would get out of Douma. But you're saying they, they had these hostages. Were those hostages amongst the victims in this attack, do you think? I think so. I mean, the, the, 
part of the negotiations, which did go through in the end, was that they have to release the hostages. And the number of hostages was 4,000, except only 200 of the hostages actually came out um, alive. So what happened to the other 3,800? You know, um, the, the thing is that the reason they put them in cages was because they were using them as human shields. You're playing the video now of the civilians in the tunnels. They um, actually released that video two weeks ago as a sort of evidence to the government that they still have the hostages, the hostages are still alive, so that they could get the negotiations going. Um, this group, Army of Islam, is actually supported and funded by Saudi Arabia. And, you know, it's interesting because if you if you see the timing of this chemical attack, um, first of all, Trump said he wants troops out of Syria. Now, why would Assad use chemical weapons if it looked like the U.S. was finally about to just leave and, you know, let him take back the entire country? It's exactly the same scenario that played out last year when uh, the U.S. State Department, almost a year to the day of this attack, the U.S. State Department said that um, regime change is no longer the objective, and now, basically, they, they... Sorry, and then a week later, a chemical attack happened, and regime change went back on the objective. And the, the interesting thing about Trump's statement is that after he said he wants to pull troops out of Syria, a few days later, he said that if Saudi Arabia wants U.S. troops to stay in Syria, they're going to have to pay for it. And, of course, Saudi Arabia pays money to this Islamic army group that's controlling um, Duma. And these are the people that conducted the false flag chemical attack. So basically, this was Saudi Arabia's way of, you know, keeping the U.S. in Syria, because basically um, they had negotiations with the U.S. and the Kurds um, in the northeast of the country, and they were basically given, like, uh, control over the northeast of the country. So Saudi Arabia thinks it owns the northeast of Syria. Um, and what does the U.S. get out of this? You know, it's it's not really Saudi Arabia that's running the show, and it's it's, it's not Saudi money either. Because, um, you know, even though the northeast of Syria is full of oil and majority of Syrian oil is there, the U.S. doesn't really need any more oil. It, the amount of oil that Syria has is nothing compared to the amount of oil that the U.S. has. The point is that they don't want Syrians to have that oil. They don't want Syria to be able to rebuild and become strong again. And why is that? Well, you know, Tucker Carlson asked that question on his show to Senator Roger Wicker, and he said it was because it was in the interest of Israel. So you're saying that it's, it's basically a conspiracy between Saudi Arabia and Israel. We've now got Saudi Arabia announcing they're going to join the strikes with France. Now, I want to flash back to this, and we'll get more into this after the break. There's a headline up on Newsweek, that famous right-wing publication. Now Mattis admits there was no evidence Assad used poison gas on his people. That's literally the headline. This came out in February. Nobody really paid much attention to it. This is about the strike that happened last year. Which was, of course, we were told, oh, beyond any shadow of a doubt, it was Assad that carried out the strike in April last year. Now they admitted back in February, listen to this, lost in the hyper-politicized hullabaloo surrounding the Nunes memorandum and the Steele dossier was a striking statement by Secretary of Defense James Mattis that the U.S. has, quote, no evidence, as his, his words, no evidence, that the Syrian government used the banned nerve agent sarin gas against its own people. This assertion flies in the face of the White House NSC memorandum, which was rapidly produced, again, with no investigation, and declassified to justify an American Tomahawk missile strike against the Shira Air Base in Syria. So they were the exact same situation again. There's no independent investigation. Oh, but it must have been Assad, right? Who else could it be? Well, no, you got it completely wrong the last time out. You lied to the American people. You lied to the world. And we're heading into something even bigger now. This could lead to absolute chaos. And we're just sleepwalking into it once again. Nobody seems to care. We'll get more into it after the break with Syrian Girl. This is the Alex Jones Show Live. Don't go away. So we have the USS Donald Cook destroyer armed with 60 Tomahawk missiles just 100 kilometers from the Russian naval base of Tartus in Syria. We have Russian jets reportedly harassing that US destroyer. And now we have this, and I just tweeted this out on my uh, Prison Planet Twitter account out of Haaretz. 
senior Russian lawmaker, U.S. strike on Syria could trigger direct military clash with Russia. Oh, joy. Senior Russian lawmaker says U.S. strike could trigger direct military clash with Russia. This is Vladimir Shamanov, a retired general who heads the Defense Affairs Committee in the lower house of parliament, who said in televised remarks today that a U.S. strike in Russia could hurt Russian servicemen and trigger Russian retaliation. Oh, gee, a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Got that to look forward to by the looks of it. He said that Russia has the necessary means for that, and the Americans and their allies know that quite well. Now, you've seen massive movement of Russian aircraft, uh, Russian uh, naval uh, facilities over the past 24 hours. Now they're saying if there's a direct confrontation, Russia could well retaliate. Shamanov em emphasized that a retaliatory Russian strike could target U.S. Navy ships and aircraft of which there are going to be plenty in the region, at least within the next few days. He added that the use of nuclear weapons is unlikely. Oh, thanks. Be thankful for small mercies there. We're joined by Syrian Girl to talk about this. Now, I want to get back into the specifics of the actual chemical weapons attack, but just touching on that for a second. You've got Russian uh, ex-retired ex general saying if there's a confront confrontation, Russia could attack U.S. warships, could literally bomb U.S. warships, We've got Russian fighter jets harassing, doing flybys of U.S. destroyers in the region near the Russian naval base in Tartus. Do you think this is just rhetoric, or could we actually be seeing the potential for direct conflict between the U.S. and Russia that could lead to a wider war? What's the risk here? I think, you know, it's a game of chicken, obviously. It's brinkmanship. But at the same time, even a game of chicken can end up with a hot war. And I think that's very likely. I mean, Russia has invested a lot. A lot of its troops are all over Syria. They're inside Syrian military bases. Um, as you saw, you know, Russian soldiers were, uh, or security officers were killed by US bombs in the last strike on Syria. So those weren't directly uh, Russian military. So perhaps because of that, there was a way out of a direct conflict there. But it's definitely, if the U.S. is going to attack Syria, it is an attack on Russia. There's no doubt about that. And it will end up in a wider war. And they don't really seem to care about that because they think that they can uh, intimidate and brinkmanship their way through by gathering, you know, the U.K., France, Saudi Arabia, you know, this team of basically this mafia of thieves and criminals. And... The fact that they're gathering these forces, I think, also doesn't bode well. As you said, it looks like it's not going to be one strike. It might be a sustained warfare, and we might see now the beginning of World War III. So it seems that the deep state has basically won or is winning. Well, of course, many people suggested that it could be the deep state pressuring Trump, saying, look, you want to prove you're not a Russian agent. You want the Mueller investigation to go away. And some people have suggested that this had a connection to the arrest of Cohen, his lawyer, yesterday, or the, the search of his files. You know, this is how you do it. You strike a, strike a blow against Russia, give them a bloody nose, uh, just to prove that you're not a Russian agent. Of course, you're going to risk World War Three, but these, these, these people kind of like wars. It's kind of how they get by, how they make business. And as he said, doesn't look like it's going to be a single strike. That's what happened last time, based on, again, no evidence whatsoever. You know, they moved all the aircraft out of the way, basically. They made a, a hole in the middle of an airfield. Some people died, but it was by no means a massive attack. Now we got the Truman Carrier Strike Group and seven warships with cruise missiles heading to the Mediterranean. They're not going to be there until 22nd of April. The French President Macron has said they're going to wait two or three days before anything happens. So it looks like this this is a build up to something absolutely massive, at least way bigger than it was last year, given the kind of heavy artil artillery that's heading towards that region, or at least is promised to, head, to be heading towards that region from the Saudis, from the UK, from France. And again, it's all based on absolutely nothing. This is the fundamental thing that angers me, the rush to war. There's no question whatsoever that this was a horrible incident that people died, but there's been no investigation and in fact, Yesterday, the, for the expert who was head of UN weapons inspection in Syria uh, came out, they came out in Swedish media. This didn't get picked up anywhere. We picked it up in English language. He's called Aka Selstrom. 
He said there was no possible benefit for Bashar al-Assad to gain in any way. He said it feels strange. They do not need it. Their tactics were already successful. And again, same situation as April 2017. Trump says they're pulling out regime change off the table, Syria making gains, taking over new areas, defeating the rebels, and suddenly a convenient chemical weapons attack happens that brings down global condemnation. Do these people not even, can they not even put two and two together at this point? Let's get back into it though, because you mentioned the army of Islam. This is, this is one of the moderate groups. Okay, this is a group, correct me if I'm wrong, they're exterminating Shia Muslims, Alawites, they want Sharia law in Syria. They want to impose, in their own words, an Islamic state. They're taking hostages, they're putting them in cages, parading them around, putting them in tunnels. And these are the moderate rebels. These are the people who we're now talking about striking a country in support of, correct or not? Well, absolutely. Um, and the, this group, the hostages that they stole from the nearby towns, they include Alawites, Christians, and Sunnis. Basically, anyone that they perceive to be um, pro-government or has any relative that's working for the government was kidnapped, no matter their religion. But this um, group, you know, they are related to Ahrar al-Sham which is, of course, as you know, a group that is linked to al-Qaeda. So it's like a three degrees of separation between them and al-Qaeda. And of course, they're run by Saudi Arabia. So um, it's interesting, like, as you said, you, this looks like a massive strike. It's important to note that yesterday, Israel struck Syria. It struck T4 air base. That air base is specifically for the defense of their Zor from ISIS. It uh, basically manufactures the drones that um, attack ISIS in the area. And, you know, an ISIS offensive was launched in conjunction to that attack as they probably, you know, always take um, advantage of it. So, like, ISIS is still a problem. Al-Qaeda is still a problem. And all this is happening. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you might say that, oh, Israel is against um, Islamists and Al-Qaeda is against Israel's interests. But they've been giving Al-Qaeda medical treatment in the Golan Heights. And Israel and Saudi Arabia have the best relations now that they've ever had because they both oppose Syria and Iran. Is, uh, in Saudi Arabia's case, it opposes Iran because they're Shiites, and that's it. That's the only reason. So um, I think that in this uh, scenario, the chemical attack um, provides the best excuse for the deep state for, um, to, for the, to keep the U.S. military in the northeast of Syria. And this comes a week after the first U.S. soldier dies in Syria. This was a week ago. A U.S. and a U.K. soldier were killed. And so this chemical attack is, again, timely because, of course, there's going to begin a discussion of why are the troops there and why are they dying. Um, so there's, there's that. And I wanted to just comment about Ak Selstrom. You know, also what, what he said in 2013, in that very big chemical attack in Damascus, he said that it was very strange that that attack happened on the same day that the OPCW had arrived. So you see, the OPCW didn't arrive after that attack. They arrived before that attack because they were there to investigate another incident in which chemical weapons were used in Aleppo against Syrian government soldiers and on a Syrian government-held area. That's what they were there to do. And on the date they arrived in Damascus, the chemical attack happened. So he said himself that he thought it was strange. Um, and so there's been all of these uh, coincidences that aren't really coincidences, as we know. Um, but what the in what's hypocritical and bizarre is that the U.S. Uh, government, some departments actually acknowledge that the rebels possess chemical weapons. Because if you were to look at the... Um, uh, travel advisory to Syria that was released by the U.S. State Department, it said that beware uh, chemical weapons are being used by both sides. So it, it's they say one thing when it comes to the United Nations and when it comes to their people, and then on the other hand, they have something completely different when it comes to the travel warning. Now, I want to get into this more because, of course, the only evidence that this entire plot, this insane plot of bombing a country is based on is unverified footage, basically from a group called the White Helmets. Let's get into the White Helmets and what they're all about in the next segment, talking to Syrian Girl. This is the Alex Jones Show live, Infowars.com. We'll be back.
We are live and we are into the fourth hour of the Alex Jones Show talking to Syrian Girl. She is at Partisan Girl on Twitter. U.S. destroyers basically right outside the Russian naval air base. Retired Russian generals saying Russia could strike U.S. ships, obviously creating a proxy war at the very least. Massive uh, situation right now in Syria. It's going to spiral out of control if things continue heading the way they are, if cooler heads don't prevail. Now, I'm looking at a headline here from Reuters. This is out of uh, Reuters, May 5th, 2013, headline. UN has testimony that Syrian rebels used sarin gas. UN human rights investigators have gathered testimony from casualties of, of Syria's civil war and medical staff, indicating that rebel forces have used the nerve agent sarin, one of the lead investigators said on Sunday. Now, this is Carla Del, Del Ponte. She said this, quote, our investigators have been in neighboring countries interviewing victims, doctors, and field hospitals. And according to their report of last week, which I have seen, there are strong concrete suspicions, but not yet incontrovertible proof of the use of sarin gas from the way the victims are treated. This was use on the part of the opposition, the rebels, not by government authorities. That's the UN that said that five years ago. We have documented cases, 52 plus by the end of 2016 alone, of ISIS factions in Syria using chemical weapons. Oh, but who would believe that this attack could possibly have been a false flag, right? That's just off the planet thinking. And Maram, isn't it true, and this was in my video, that they discovered an actual rebel chemicals, chemical weapons factory in this same region where this attack happened just a few weeks ago? That's exactly right. As they were um, taking over new and new areas, they basically came across what seems like a chemical weapons lab uh, filled with bottles full of chlorine. This was all filmed. Uh, the footage is online. You, know, you could see that the place was basically untouched except by rubble. Um, and it's, it's perfectly clear that anyone can make chemicals. I mean, these guys are making makeshift bombs. They have the capability. They've been uh, get, making gas cylinder bombs for the last five years. And on top of which, I'm sure that they have help from intelligence agencies from many countries that have an interest to see this war continue. So I have no, there's really, it's who benefits and who has the means. It's the rebels and the security agencies that want the war to continue. Um, and if you look at, you know, who are the voices that are pushing for the war? It's coming from people like Tony Blair, who caused the Iraq war and uh, because he, he can be trusted on ISIS. interventions in the Middle East, right? Tony Blair, he's got a perfect track record of foreign interventions in the Middle East. Let's all listen to him. That's a great idea, right? Exactly. And he made his uh, case for the Iraq war based on what? Chemical weapons, WMDs. It's almost yeah, like chemical weapons and WMDs is the only like uh, excuse that they have to start wars, either that or creating democracies. But it seems to be, you know, used over and over and over again, and is including with the Skirpal case. Um, what's interesting with this Skirpal case where they accused Russia of attempting to assassinate a ex-spy with a chemical weapon is that just a day prior to this chemical attack, they a story came out trying to link Syria to this assassination of a Russian spy in the UK. Oh. And they're trying to make a connection between Syria and Russia and chemical weapons. I don't know why it's always chemical weapons, but I think it has to do with the fact that a lot of the time before they invade a country, they want a disarmament of chemical weapons. Well, I, some people have also suggested, and in fact, uh, I think it was uh, Ackerson that said this, it would be difficult to investigate this attack because of the use of chlorine, the effects of it disappear rapidly in the victims. So maybe that's another reason why it's convenient to use this. We'll get more into it after the break with Syrian Girl, talk about the White Helmet, talk about where this is going geopolitically. This is the Alex Jones Show Live. We'll be back after the break. Breaking news at Infowars.com. Don't go away. We're going to do one more segment here. Maybe we'll stretch it into two segments with Syrian Girl talking about the uh, imminent attack on Syria is what it looks like. Here's a tweet from airlive.net. According to reports, British forces are mobilizing at their bases in Cyprus and Rafale fighter jets could take off from St. Dizier Air Base in France for possible strikes against Syria. So it looks like it's not going to be this symbolic 
one strike that we had in April last year, again, as a result of another chemical weapons attack, was completely unproven. Looks like this is a, a global effort. Could they actually be trying to still unseat to regime change in Syria, given how disastrous it was in Iraq, given how disastrous it was in Libya? We're talking to Syrian girl right now. And the evidence for all this basically comes from one source. They said it was unverified footage, and then it was footage from the white helmets for the uh, from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. These are all groups completely aligned with the regime change ad agenda, completely aligned with rebel factions, in some cases aligned with actual ISIS factions. They have been from the very start. And this is, this is the neutral independent group that we're supposed to believe as the complete impartial evidence on all this. Maram, tell us about the white helmets. Can the white helmets really be trusted? Well, the white helmets are basically uh, the army of Islam or Al Qaeda, basically putting on a white helmet. That's all it is. Uh, the group has been filmed waving Al Qaeda flags at an Al Qaeda rally, carrying weapons, torturing Syrian soldiers, uh, holding up severed heads of Syrian soldiers, and um, faking video footage multiple times of uh, chemical attacks and saving, rescuing children and rescuing each other. They did a very silly uh, video of themselves basically frozen in time, rescuing this guy. And later he comes out and he's like, oh, I'm fine. But his acting during the rescue was as if though he was very much in pain and very used to acting. I mean, it's no wonder they won an Oscar, isn't it? So um, it's... <laughs> It's all because they act. And who runs this group? Who who invented it? Who gave Al Qaeda these white helmets? Well, it's an MI6 agent named George, uh, James Le, Le Measure. and of course the group is funded by uh, Holland, the U.S., the U.K. And it's interesting that Holland, actually, the United Nations said, "Oh, this is a very trustworthy group." Well, of course they'd say that because they're the ones who are paying them. So. Um, you know, again, like th this video that came out, there's no way to verify whether it happened this yesterday or last year or six months ago. There's no date on it. There's no. There's been no bodies that came out. I mean, the group actually surrendered Duma. The the Russians are completely in Duma, and there's no, there's nothing to show where these people died. The video did reveal. You know, the the corpses were actually under the ground. And near them was a gas burning stove. And if you're burning wood under the ground, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be sarin. It doesn't even have to be chlorine. It could be something as simple as carbon monoxide. You know, and it's it's unfortunate that they just they chose basically to kill children because they can't fight back and they make the best false flag imagery. And what would Assad benefit from gassing kids if it's gonna basically spark World War Three. I know. So the, 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 the sheer number of the lack of number of people who are asking that question in the mainstream media is that so it's just so obviously not in his favor to do this when they were clearing out the region of Eastern Ghouta. Absolutely incredible. Just people just aren't asking the question though. Now we've got this this potential for this war to explode. We've got all these different countries getting involved. We've also got the wider propaganda war, which is being fought, obviously, on the internet. We had a poll yesterday, a Fox News poll, and I voted in this poll, I retweeted this poll. It was consistently throughout the day, 65% against military intervention in Syria throughout the whole day. Then in like the final few hours of this poll being active, it suddenly flipped. Now, what happened with that poll? Well, there's this guy that is basically a, a journalist for the Muslim Brotherhood um, who has 500,000 followers on Twitter. And he tweeted this poll and said, guys, vote vote um, yes for war against Syria. And after he tweeted that, um, there was a massive surge of like 80,000 votes within the span of one to two hours. And even though his tweet you know, had a, a large uh, retweet, 
um, number, like a thousand favorites, 500 uh, retweets. I don't think that by itself would have been enough. I would hazard a guess that they op they used bots. So this is supposed to be a poll for Fox News viewers, and you're having the Muslim Brotherhood come in and vote for war. And isn't it interesting that the neocons are on the side of what the Muslim Brotherhood want? Um, John McCain and the uh, neocon Republicans are all now on the same side of Al-Qaeda? And they have been for the past six years since we've been talking about this. Okay, let's wrap it up. Just final comments. Where do you see this going? I mean, do you see it as a limited strike, as kind of a symbolic thing like we saw last year? Or do you see them actually, even at this late stage, still trying this regime change effort? Where do you see this going in the, in the medium and long term? I think... You know, it's very difficult because the emotions are running high right now. But I think what the U.S. wants is somehow to remain in the northeast of Syria for a prolonged period of time. Perhaps this intimidation tactic is, is an attempt to get some kind of negotiations towards that. Maybe it'll be a small strike, but I would say that we shouldn't treat it as that, that because a small strike is still a strike. I mean, there's been consistent strikes and um, the degradation of Syrian defenses and the strengthening of ISIS and al-Qaeda, the perpetuation of the war, the, the uh, creation of refugees. It's not in anyone's interest. So we should treat this as though it is going to be a big strike and as though it might trigger World War III, because it might do that. And if we don't treat it as such and we don't act now, we may live to regret the day. So um, I would say that if you can, you know, call your local governments, call the White House, um, do whatever you can, what is in your power, to try to resist and show opposition to this. It might not be for, it might not work, because I hazard a guess that the uh, U.S. deep state, you know, the democracy is basically dead. But it's, you know, it's, it's better than nothing, and we have to do what we can with the limited power that we have. So let's stand against this, because there's a 50-50 chance it's going to be World War III. Amazing. Well, just tell people in a final minute here how they can find you on social media and on YouTube. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. Uh, find me at Partisan Girl on Twitter and Syrian Girl Partisan on YouTube. I'm also on BitChute Syrian Girl and on Minds um, Syrian Girl or Partisan Girl and uh, a bunch of other things. So please check out my Twitter and, and add me on those. Okay, we really appreciate you, Syrian Girl. We'll get you back on as this unfolds, which it inevitably will over the next few days, maybe sure. even starting tonight. But well, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. OK, there goes Syrian girl. We have about a minute and a half left in this segment. So let's go back to this news again. Massive headline out of Haaretz. Senior Russian lawmaker, US strike on Syria could trigger direct military clash with Russia. He's basically saying he's emphasizing that a retaliatory Russian strike could target US Navy ships and aircraft. He's saying that Russia could bomb US Navy destroyers if they target Syrian government positions. That is absolutely massive. We also have Trump canceling his trip to South Africa. President Trump has canceled his scheduled trip to multiple South American sorry, countries originally planned for this week, the White House said Tuesday. So Trump's going to be in place. He was set to attend the eighth summit of the Americas in Lima, Peru, and then go to Colombia. He's not going to do that because he's got things on his plate, and we all know what they are. We have report Russia jams U.S. drones over Syria to thwart airstrikes. The Russian military has figured out how to jam some U.S. military drones in airspace over Syria, NBC News report on Tuesday. So the Russians are very busy boys right now as this potential World War III scenario escalates. And really not that many people are talking about it until it happens. There doesn't seem to be as much interest around it, as much concern around it as there should be right now absolutely incredible times we're living in this is the alex jones show live we'll be back after the break breaking news at infowars.com don't go away you know i've got some talking points here about caveman from infowarslife.com but instead of going with those talking points let me just give you what i've experienced personally from all the wives tales in every culture we know that the bones have the essence we know chicken noodle soup is great for people that are sick Again, in every culture, this has been reported because it works. And there's no way to quantify how strong this is, but the amount of bone protein 
and the amount of marrow and the amount of concentrated life force that is in this is incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, whether it's for your joints, whether it's for your arteries and your veins, whether it's for your brain, whether it's for energy, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the strongest, most concentrated bone broth formula out there, and it's amazing. Find out for yourself today at InfoWarsStore.com what it can do for you and your family. And again, I want to thank you all for your support. You are funding the Information War in 2018.